Good morning. It is good to have you here this morning in worship. And I um, want to let you know we are um, continuing through a series, uh, actually almost done with this series, uh, called uh, Upside Down Kingdom. Uh, this morning, um, I want to let you know, uh, I really, really struggled uh, with a way to talk about what Jesus teaches uh, here in this passage as he's moving toward concluding uh, his teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. But there's one thing that struck me as I was reading through and studying the passage that was shared this morning, that if there was ever a time where the upside-down kingdom that Jesus talks about might be poorly identified by our amount of inner turmoil, disappointment, hurt, uh, and abuse, it's now. For example, I, I don't think it's too much of a mystery to, to many of us in here that over the past few years, there's been an incredible amount of disturbing numbers of church and faith community related scandals. The names are numerous, the well-known, people who at one time, and in some cases still, they've led hundreds, maybe thousands, and all the while, away from the spotlight, out of the sight of those that they claim to be leading in love, their lives indicate something that's completely fake, phony, and untrue. And the most disturbing part to me in all of that is it kind of has a uh, feel of a wash, rinse, recycle all over again, continually happening. You know, many years ago, I kind of, uh, I remember distinctly kind of wagging my finger and, you know, at the sexual abuse scandal that seemed to have rocked the Catholic Church, only to read about or to see the latest video confession of yet another Christian ministry leader who had been caught maybe verbally dressing down um, Christian co-workers or generally treating those that they were called to love and to care for with disdain and disregard. And one of the worst parts to me is how often, how quickly we have witnessed folks like this, folks who have literally taken advantage of their role as pastors, as preachers, ministry leaders of some sort, return to places of prominence and influence that they've held within the local church. What they thereby communicate to a watching world is that the church is not the example that Jesus calls us to be in terms of being an upside-down kingdom. And as a matter of fact, may just be one of the most toxic spaces you could enter into. That's not the way of the upside-down kingdom at all. I tell you what, before we go any further, let's take a moment, let's pray together. So we continue to look at this passage from Matthew's gospel. God, we ask that you would give us wisdom, Lord, that we would hear you in a different way today. God, these warnings, these, these words of literal condemnation are not to be taken lightly. And God, may we not just see them as an opportunity for us to point fingers at other people. However, Lord, may we see what you share here from Matthew chapter 7. Lord, as a challenge to do the hard work, the intense work of walking in a way and in a manner 
that consistently exemplifies what it means to be a citizen of the upside down kingdom. We pray this in your son's name. Amen and amen. This is what I want you to walk away with from today. Okay, I want you to walk away with this idea. In the upside down kingdom, Jesus is very clear. There are no disguised intentions or faces. Falseness will be exposed and will have absolutely no place in his kingdom and among his kingdom people. Guys, that is a very heavy and serious word. We come across this passage in Matthew, and sometimes we, I know I do, I tend to take it kind of like lightly. Jesus is getting to the core of the issue in this portion of the Sermon on the Mount. So, Jesus is saying that there's a day of reckoning. It's a day of reckoning for false prophets. I'm going to pick up a little bit more of the verse that we're looking at, the verses that we're looking at, beginning in verse 15. Jesus says this, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, Will you recognize them? Jesus in Matthew 7.15 says, we're supposed to watch out for false prophets. They come to us in sheep's clothing. You know, they, they look really friendly. They look harmless, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. And this metaphor, what it does is it paints this picture of individuals who appear harmless, even beneficial, on the outside, but they're destructive on the inside. They may seem to have the right words, the, the right actions, even the right affiliations. They know the people that we know. But their true nature is contrary to the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus said these words almost 2,000 years ago. And I'm sure he didn't have the slightest idea, right? He didn't know that I was going to be uh, preaching this Sermon on the Mount. Yes, he did. I'm just saying that for literary saying. Okay, Jesus didn't know I was going to preach these words, but here we are in the midst of one of the most confusing moments with regard to what the church is supposed to be, who the church is supposed to be, what the church is called to do, and what it means to be the presence of Jesus on the earth. So how did, how did Jesus know? How did he know? Well, for one thing, I think Jesus knew, and he was just verbalizing it. He knew that there would always be false prophets, that there would be people who would come along every generation, and they would take advantage of us. How did he know? Well, he said you need to look for their outward appearance. Be mindful of how people look on the outward, on the outside. They present themselves as genuine believers, uh, using Christian language, right? Engaging in Christian practices. Sometimes they hold positions of influence within the church or Christian community, making it even more challenging to identify them. However, here's what Jesus warns. He says, don't be deceived by appearances. And the apostle Paul kind of carries that thought on in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 through 15. Paul says this, and no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Jesus also talks about false teaching. False prophets often distort the truth of the gospel. And sometimes, here's the thing about that. This is in my notes. Sometimes it's, it's just little, a little tweak. Not a great big change, but sometimes it's just little things 
that get distorted when they preach the gospel. A lot of times they do it to suit their own purposes or even, ultimately, to lead people astray. They may emphasize certain aspects of Christianity while neglecting some others. They lead to this imbalanced and inaccurate representation of the faith. Apostle John wrote this. He wrote this in 1 John 4, 1. He says, dear friends, this is really important. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, some are obvious, but some are less obvious. The followers of, for example, Mary Baker, Mary Baker Eddy. And she founded what's known as, have you ever heard of Christian science? Does that sound familiar? Founded Christian science. She taught that suffering is an illusion. And also Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon. He gained more followers every, every day. But let's, let's face it, you know, their, their fruit how they live, it's pretty ad admirable, right? I mean, they have strong families, they, they live these really upstanding lives, They're, they have a strong commitment to community, they support the church, and all those things are good. And yet, mm, they're telling you something that's not true. That's false. And how do we know? Because what they teach adds to and some places contradicts God's revelation in Scripture. And then the Apostle John, who lived longer than any of the other apostles, and he kind of gave us the last word to speak on this when he said this, I warn everyone <clears throat> who hears the words of prophecy in this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book, and if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. I don't know about you guys, but I read that passage of scripture, and I think like what I do up here and other like me, this is serious stuff. And you know who else needs to be really careful about this? You as well. You do too. You need to really, and what I'm, when I'm saying being careful, what I'm talking about is listening, being keyed in. Is someone telling you something that kind of sounds true, but based on what you have read in God's word, it doesn't quite match up? That's a good warning sign. That's God's spirit at work in you, warning you, warning you. What else? Jesus talks about their fruit. Jesus says this, some people are obvious, they're easy to identify. For example, how many of you have ever heard of Jim Jones? Ever heard of Jim Jones? Yeah, it's a tragic story, right? Incredibly tragic story, who, who led people to, to death in Guyana. Also, people like David Koresh in Waco, Texas. When Jesus says you will know them by their fruit, the fruit of their teaching is pretty evil, <laughs> clearly in direct opposition to the message of life that Jesus brings and gives. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 16, that we'll recognize false prophets by their fruit. And this fruit that he mentions refers to kind of the outcomes, what comes out of their teachings, their actions. Are they leading people closer to Jesus or are they causing confusion, division, spiritual harm? Are they people who promote love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5? Or, or, or are they fostering something else, something outside of these things, something in contradiction to these things. The best test of a prophet or a teacher is not so much the miracles they claim to be able to perform as the fruit they produce, as the fruit of their character. That's how you know if someone is a problem, if someone is false. And as we seek to follow Jesus faithfully, we need to heed this warning we got to be vigilant against those who kind of would lead us down a different path. 
the really, really interesting thing about this passage we're looking at is how specific Jesus gets. Jesus is very specific about all the things that false prophets do. You need to consider them again. Jesus says prophesying in whose name? Whose name? In his name. He says driving out demons in whose name? His name. What about performing miracles? In his name. You could even substitute things like going to church, reading the Bible, leading Bible studies. Jesus seems to be saying to us that it's absolutely possible to be doing all of these things for Jesus and yet not have a relationship with him. Friends, that's the point. You can do all of those things and still not have a relationship with Jesus. So, what is an obvious sign of a authentic, of a true person of God, teacher of God, prophet of God? Well, they produce good fruit. In the passage, Jesus uses this metaphor of a tree and its fruit. He illustrates this profound truth. He says, likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Like, that seems like so straightforward and simple, right? I mean, I just, I just you don't have the genius to figure that out. And he says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. Thus, by the fruit, Will you recognize them? So there is this way to kind of recognize what your spiritual life looks like. In essence, Jesus is saying that our actions, the fruit that we produce, they're a reflection of what's going on on the inside. What is our spiritual condition from the inside out? Right? A good tree representing a person with a healthy relationship with God, they'll produce good fruit, actions that are in line with the character of God. On the other hand, a bad tree, which represents a person who's not in right standing with God, produces bad fruit, actions that are contrary to God's will and character. Now, let me help you out on something. I just read just the other day where a pastor kind of, um, he had somebody come into his church and they made a, rep they made a presentation that had something to do with, you know, the biblical uh, account of creation. Well, he was really upset about the presenter who shared what was shared about the biblical account of creation because the presenter had long hair. And I read that story and I thought to myself, okay, that's somebody who's really confused and is really confusing the people in their church. Long hair is not an indicator of godliness. Thank you, Pastor Bryce. Right? Long hair is not an indicator of ungodliness. It just isn't. That's not an example of bad fruit. Jesus is talking about something that's much deeper than what our hair looks like. What else is Jesus talking about? Well, he makes it clear. At the same time, you don't prove that you're godly just because you're doing good works. Salvation is free. It's a free gift from God. It comes to us through faith in Jesus. Now, here's the deal. Once we receive that gift, our lives should begin to kind of naturally take on and reflect the character of Jesus. The fruits we talked about earlier, the, these fruit of a life that's transformed by the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faith, control, that's evidence of a life being transformed. Jesus gives this warning. Every tree that does not bear good fruits cut down and thrown in the fire. It's a reminder. This is a reminder. Man, it's a reminder that there are consequences when we don't live in accordance with what God's will is, if we claim to follow Jesus, but our lives don't reflect his character, Jesus is pretty clear. We come up against the judgment of God. That's not something that I'm making up. That's something that Jesus is really clear about as he begins to wind down this upside-down kingdom teaching. 
It's about being discerning, recognizing that true spiritual leaders are known by the fruit of their lives, not just their words. Now, Jesus goes on and he clarifies even further for his listeners some crucial differences. As he explains, not only is there a a, a reckoning for uh, folks who are teachers, who are uh, leaders, but Jesus says that there's also a day of reckoning that comes for false followers, people who don't really mean it who aren't really doing the, doing the thing. They're not really letting God do what God wants to do. He says this, pick it up in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name, perform miracles? And then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Folks, I don't know about you, but I remember hearing that verse as a high school student many, many years ago. Well, not many, many years ago. It was a while ago. I remember hearing those words and freaking out. Because I thought, I'm, I'm trying to do this. Am I really doing it right? Am I really doing it right? Am I, am I really doing it right? Is Jesus going to say to me at the end of time, I don't know you, Rob. You said you lived for me, but I have no idea who you are. So is this some kind of trick bag that Jesus has got us in? Is he trying to fool us? No, he's very, very clear. That's the good part. He's clear about, hey, I will not know you if you don't live a certain way. Not, I will not know you. I will not know you if you haven't lived a certain way. That's the key. Living a certain way. This passage makes it clear that everyone who tells Jesus that uh, he is Lord is disciple. Don't miss that part. If you say to Jesus, you're Lord of my life, that makes you a disciple. A lot of people, they love Jesus. They dig him. You know, he's great. Oh, it's cool that he's a savior. That's awesome. Lord, that's different. That means Jesus has a final say. And there's lots of folks who aren't into that. That's what Jesus is saying the problem is. The distinguishing factor, are we doing the will of the Father or not? So the word disciple, that word gets tossed out quite a bit in Christian circles, right? We hear the word disciple. I mean, we talk about the fact that there were 12 disciples, right? But what exactly does that word mean? Here's what I want you, I want you to write this down. I think this is a great definition. Here's what a disciple is. A disciple is, I don't see a lot of you writing. A disciple, a disciple is someone who has made a decision to be someone else within the right conditions and circumstances for the purposes of doing what that other person does or becoming what that other person has become. And the other person that we're trying to be like, the other person that we want to become like, is who? That's what it means to be a disciple. Become like Jesus. A true disciple, right? A true disciple is what we're called. True disciples are not only people who profess faith in Christ, but they live that faith out on a daily basis. They're obedient to God's word. They seek to do his will. Their lives bear the fruit of the spirit that we talked about before. They have a personal relationship with Jesus. They spend time in in prayer studying the word. They strive to live in a way where the center of their own universe and life is Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a disciple. They're not perfect, okay? Okay. Let me make sure that you hear, it's not about perfection. 
but they're continually being transformed. That's what we're called to, continually being transformed into the image of Jesus growing in our faith. Now, you have that, but what's a false disciple? These are people who appear religious on the outside, but their hearts on the inside, man, they're not even close to God. They say the right things. They even perform impressive deeds. We've read about them, prophesying, casting out demons, performing miracles as mentioned in this passage. There's a song that I heard a long time ago by a guy named Keith Green, a song called The Sheep and the Goats. If you have not heard that song, find that song. It's an oldie, but it's good, right? And it just tells a story where in the time comes, the Son of Man returns, and he separates people as sheep and goats. And if you read through the story, Jesus says to those on his right, the sheep, come to my kingdom. You people who you're blessed of the Father because your lives reflected what it means to be my follower. You saw people who were in need. You saw people who had a uh, 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 that wanted to be, that needed to be loved, that people who were hurting, and you welcomed them, you clothed them, you fed them. And the people standing there say to Jesus, what? W when, did, when did we see that? Jesus, the Son of Man, replies, you may not have really recognized me, but that was me. I came to you as someone who needed clothes, someone who needed food, someone who needed to be loved, and you loved me. Come on in to the Father's kingdom. Then Jesus turns to the people on his left, and when you listen to this song by Keith Green, it's great. Jesus goes through that same, he says, hey, bottom line is, I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I needed clothes, you didn't clothe me. I was in prison, you didn't visit me. And you know what the people on his left say? The, the goats, they say the exact same thing. Jesus, when were you hungry? Like, we had some creepy people come to our door one time looking for food, but we weren't going to help them out. Are you kidding me? And, you know, Jesus, I did have a friend who went to jail. Yeah, and he was telling me, that, you know, I know it was up there, you know, locked up for years and nobody came to visit him. I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to hang out with those. And Jesus says, you didn't do that for me. In the same way that the sheep did, the goats didn't do. So the bottom line is, you can do impressive things. You can be an impressive person. But if those actions aren't consistent, if they're not rooted in what it really means to be becoming a disciple of Jesus, there's accountability that awaits us. Jesus himself says, I'll, I never knew you. Away from me. You're evildoers. And that is harsh language. That is really harsh language. I know it. <laughs> I'm preparing this sermon. I'm thinking, wow, this is really, this is going to be a fun one to preach to everybody right? But it's true. These are chilling words. They reveal kind of the seriousness of what it means when you're a false disciple, when you aren't really living what Jesus calls us to live. So again, I want to press pause as we move through this passage, because I want you to be really clear on this. Jesus is up to something at this moment. Jesus is standing in sitting, standing, with probably what's a pretty decent-sized group of people who've come to hear what he has to say because he's a new teacher, and what he's teaching is so powerful. And so there's this decent-sized group of people, probably, and all of a sudden, but not really, Jesus kind of goes into this sidebar of what it means to be a true disciple versus a false disciple. Why do you think he's doing that? Why do you think Jesus at this point goes that direction? Well, when we wrap up this series next week, Jesus sends 
that it was time to give his listeners an idea of all that was at stake to be his disciple. Of all that was at stake to be part of his upside down kingdom. Jesus did not want to give folks this false idea that you could, you could earn your salvation, you could be good enough. True faith, as I said, it's, it's about a transformed life. But I also want you to know that I'm pretty sure that Jesus did not want to cause us to be filled with fear or doubt either. That's why he challenged us in the Sermon on the Mount. He was very specific for us to examine our lives, our hearts. Jesus is saying, are you merely just moving your lips to profess faith? Or are you living it out? Are you really doing the will of the Father? Are you living for your own desires? Are you a true disciple? Or are you just deceiving yourself? These are really hard, hard questions, but they're necessary ones if we truly want to follow Jesus Christ. And here's the end. In the end, the difference between true and false disciples comes down to the condition of your heart. God looks at the heart. You know what God doesn't look at necessarily? He doesn't look at all the cool things we do, all the things that everybody else can see. He knows whether our profession of faith is genuine or not. And he calls us to be true disciples. Those who not only call him Lord, but strive to do his will in everything. Some of you are old like me, or older like me. Um, back in 1971, Earth Day. How many of you here were here for Earth Day back in 1971? Do you remember what Earth Day was back in 1971? 1971. Keep America beautiful. Have you ever heard that phrase? Keep America beautiful? You know? They launched what has been recognized back on Earth Day 1971, one of the 50 greatest commercials of all time. Does this image look familiar to anybody? Have you seen this image? The commercial had in it someone who was called the Crying Indian. It was a one-minute ad that featured a Native American man paddling down this junk-infested river that was surrounded by smog and pollution and trash. The camera then panned to the Native American's cheerless face just as a single tear rolled down his cheek. I'll tell you, I was a little kid at the time. I cried. I saw the camera. I remember distinctly watching it on TV, and it made me cry. It was sad. The ad's performer was a man named Iron Eyes Cody. And he became, in, in a real literal sense, he became the face of Native Americans, indigenous people. And he was honored with a star on Hollywood's Walk of Fame. And long before his fame, though, in the 1970s, Iron Eyes Cody was featured as kind of the noble Indian. He starred in a variety of Western films along actors like John Wayne, Ronald Reagan. And by all accounts, he was Hollywood's and America's favorite Native American. But several real indigenous actors, indigenous American actors, soon came to doubt his authenticity. Jay Silverheels, that's the gentleman who played Tonto. You ever seen Tonto in Long Ranger? Um, there was another um, uh, well-known um, indigenous actor by the name of Running Deer, who was a stuntman. And he agreed that there was something strangely off-putting about this man's heritage. And a reporter visited Iron Eyes Cody's hometown, and he made a startling discovery. Both 
this man's parents were full-blooded Italian people. How did he fake his real identity for so long? How did he do that? Apparently, the residents in his hometown of Louisiana, they were too invested in supporting their successful local boy. Local boy makes good. Hollywood, along with the ad agencies that profited from his image, relied on a false image. Even after his history was revealed, Iron Eyes Cody refused to admit the truth behind his public persona. He continued to wear his braided wig headdress and moccasins and kept talking about his connection to the great spirit. This is the warning that comes to us from Matthew chapter 7. You can look the part. You can maybe do the things. But at the end of it all, friends, Jesus is warning us as upside down kingdom citizens about pretending to be his people, pretending to be something we are not. And he's warning that a day of reckoning is coming. Are you ready? Are we ready? That's what Jesus is calling and inviting us to. Just be ready. Just be ready. Would you pray with me? Father, this is, a, this is a tough word. It is a warning word. God, I'm so grateful that even when you warn us, you do so in a way that is clear, that is filled with compassion, that's filled with direction about what it is that must be be done, that we must be about, what, that we must avoid in order to truly be citizens of your upside-down kingdom. God, you have gone before us and shown us you have lived the way you've called us and invited us to live. May we do so with the certainty, with the promise that you walk with us because you walk with us because you've already walked this path. That's so good to know. God, we are grateful for your love and for the clarity of what you are inviting us into. Lord, we ask that um, as we live this life, as we walk in your way, God, that you are honored and that we are transformed fully into your likeness so that when we do see your face, you will say to us, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your Father's rest. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen.